very first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, and find chapter 32, Genesis chapter 32. It's important during these times of um, revival services to have a time of prayer and uh, specific prayer meetings where we're seeking the Lord for revival and asking the Lord to revive our hearts, revive the church, and then as well help us to see others trust Jesus Christ as Savior, others to be saved. And we had a good prayer meeting after the service last night. And uh, it's for ladies, it's for men, it's for young people. So the entire family would be able to stay uh, and just have it right in the auditorium. We're going to do that again tonight, just after the service, at the conclusion of the service. We'll wait a few minutes, uh, and then we'll just have a brief uh, time of prayer here. If you can only stay for a little bit and you need to slip out, that's fine. Uh, but it would be a good thing uh, for you uh, to just say, you know, I need to stop and pray and ask the Lord to revive our hearts and revive our family and uh, help us to draw closer to the Lord and then help our church. Our, our church needs the matter of prayer. Uh, now, tomorrow night, we like to do a prayer meeting as well, but tomorrow night's going to be before the service. The service is again at 6.30 tomorrow evening at, on Saturday, but the prayer meeting will be at 6 p.m., okay? So it'll be 6 p.m., and we'll be meeting in the room back here, the kitchen area. So if you're able to uh, come early and have a brief prayer time uh, for the service and just the Lord to work in our hearts, uh, let's do that at 6. It'll be tomorrow. It'll be early before the service, but tonight we'll have one just following the service, and I'd love for you to be able to stay for that. Do you have Genesis chapter 32? If you do, uh, would you mind standing out of respect of God's Word? Genesis chapter 32, and to find, if you will, uh, verse 22. Genesis 32, verse 22, the Bible says, And he rose up that night and took two of his wives and two women servants and two of his eleven sons and passed over the four Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. This is speaking of Jacob. Verse 24 says, And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint and as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob, verse 30, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. The title of the message is in that phrase, verse 30, face to face face to face. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, Lord, I do ask for your help. Would you please give it? And Lord, I pray that you fill me with your spirit and help meet the need of each one here tonight. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. <clears throat> Jacob had a brother named Esau, and they did not go, get along uh, a lot of times because it was Jacob's fault. Jacob was the one that was the deceiver. He was the trickster. He was the liar and the manipulator, and he tried to make things happen. Jacob tricked his brother out of uh, getting his birthright. He came in, he was so hungry, and he got the birthright uh, from him and really exchanged that, and there's a lot more to that. Uh, but then also there came a time when they would have the blessing from the father before the father would die. Now, this was a pretty big thing in the Old Testament. And so the father, Isaac, was up in years. He was so uh, elderly that his eyesight was poor. He could still hear and have his other senses, but his eyesight was bad. And so um, he said to Esau, the firstborn, he said, go out and uh, get me a deer. The Bible includes deer hunting. Did you know that? And uh, go get me a venison and uh, bring it in, fix it. And uh, after you prepare it and I eat, then I will give you the blessing of the firstborn son. Well, he left and Jacob and his mom had this plan to deceive Isaac. And so he took 
Esau's clothing and put it on. And then he took a goat. Instead of killing a deer, go hunting, taking that time, they just killed a, a goat, a kid, if you will, of a goat. And um, his, while his mom prepared that, he took the hair of the goat and he put it on the back of his hands and the back of his neck. And what he was going to do is to simulate Esau. Esau was an outdoorsman. He had a particular smell of being outdoors, I guess, a lot. And then he also was a hairy man. And so they would do that. And, and so he came in, Jacob did, and uh, Esau's, uh, I saw Isaac's probably a little shocked that he came in so quickly. And, and uh, he said, Father, I'm here for my blessing. Would you please bless me? And he said, it doesn't sound like uh, Esau. He said, no, I, I'm Esau. But it really wasn't Esau, it was Jacob. And I said, come here, let me smell you. He smelled him, smelled like Esau. I'll just let your imagination run wild with that. And, uh, but not only did he smell like Esau, but he said, let me touch you. And so he touches the back of his hand, and he feels the goat's hair, and he touches the back of his neck, and he feels the goat's hair, and he says, yep, feels like Esau. He had to be one hairy dude. Uh, let me tell you, that had to be incredible. Could you imagine snuggling up to that guy at night? <laughs> Woo! And uh, so he was a hairy guy. And let me tell you, uh, he felt like it. And he said, okay, well, uh, doesn't sound like Esau, but it must be. And so I'll bless you. And so he gives him the blessings of the firstborn. Jacob stole, in essence, the blessing of his brother Esau. He left and Esau comes in. Esau comes in. And he says, father, I've Went hunting, and I got the deer, I prepared it for you. All right, would you please now give me your blessing? He said, who? <laughs> you can almost hear his shrill old voice as he has, says, no, my son, I've already given your blessing away to your brother. And he realizes what happened. In his anguish, you know, Esau cries out, oh, father, do you not have a blessing for me? And he gave him a secondary blessing but it wasn't like the blessing of the firstborn. And as a result, he made a determination in his heart, in the, his anger. He said, Be, when my dad dies, I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. Well, mom saw his anger and what his heart was toward him and afraid that he would take his life at any time. He told Jacob, she told Jacob to go away. And they sent him off into another country. And he went to go spend some time with his uncle Laban. <laughs> well, the trickster has met his match, and now sowing comes back with the result of reaping. It always does. And uh, he gives tricks there, and, um, and there's a long story about all of that that he was tricked about. He ended up spending 20 to 21 years of his life there. And how much of that was a waste, I don't know how much of it was in simply God's design. But in spite of himself, God did bless Jacob. God told Jacob in a dream to go back home. Now he's heading back home. And he's getting ready to face the biggest problem he's ever had to face, and that's his brother. And this danger of his brother now wanting to take his life. And we see that Jacob is just simply wanting relief from his trouble. But God is seeking to bring him closer to himself and to revive him. You see, before we can come face to face with our problems, God must bring us face to face with himself. Would you see tonight that maybe while you're seeking relief from your troubles, God is seeking to revive you in the midst of your troubles? And we're going to see as Jacob comes back and he's going to travel to one particular location and then a second geographical location and then a third is mentioned as well. And it is mentioned in the Bible and I believe there's some importance to it and each of these places have a meaning, a definition in them and there's going to be a spiritual application. And I believe at each geographical location it signifies for us a step that we need to take in our spiritual journey of being revived and drawing closer to the Lord and experiencing God's presence in our life. The first place is called Mahanaim. Mahanaim. Look, if you would, in uh, verses uh, 1, all the way to back to the beginning of the chapter, verse 1, really, uh, all the way to almost verse 20, it talks about uh, this place of Mahanaim, and, and then he's getting ready to transition from it. Uh, but look at the verse 1. The Bible says, And Jacob went on his way, and the angel of God, the angels of God met him. 
And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. So God opens his spiritual eyes and he looks up and he sees angels. Did you realize angels all are, are all around? <laughs> There is a spiritual battle going on. There's, there are angels and there are, de, there are demons. There are demonic, there are fallen angels. And they're battling all the time. And um, I believe more than one time there's been a guardian angel that has helped us and protected us and taken care of us. And it would be something to be able to see an angel. Now, in the New Testament, whenever one angel appears to Joseph or to Mary or to someone else, uh, Zacharias or whoever, what typically is the first thing that the angel says to that person that he appears to? Fear not. <laughs> Why? Yeah, they're scared to death of this angel. Why? Because when you're looking at an angel, you're probably looking up. They're probably bigger than us. They're definitely brighter, and they're glorious. They're, they have an intimidation. I don't think you're going to go, oh, look, there's an angel. <laughs> you know, you're probably not going to do that, okay? So now he gets to see not just one angel, but a host of angels. And these hosts of angels are there with Jacob, to protect him. Mahanaim. You know what it means? It means double camp or double host. Two hosts. In other words, here is God's host of angels up here. Ready to protect Jacob. And here is Jacob's host down here. His family. And, uh, which is huge at the time. And all the servants that he has. Double host. But what takes place? We're going to see the spiritual application is this. Would you mark this down? Mahanaim is the place of dependency. The place of dependency. What God wants Jacob to learn is this, is to trust me. Trust me, Jacob, with your life, with your protection, with everything else. Just depend upon me. But Jacob is so self-dependent. Jacob's independence is seen in so many ways. He always looks out for number one. He always has a plan. He has a strategy. He tries to work it out. Uh, look, if you would, at verse 3. It says, And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, into the land of Seir and into the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto Lord e uh, my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau. Also, he cometh to meet thee. And 400 men with him. Well, that's nice. A welcome home party. <laughs> Probably armed. Trained men, ready to do what? <laughs> Take care of the job that uh, Esau most likely intended in his heart years ago. Look at verse 7. Then Jacob was greatly, what's the next word? Afraid. That's afraid. Then we're going to get to the next one. He was greatly afraid and what? Distressed. Afraid and distressed. You know, independence, that is a lack of dependence upon God, can be seen in fear and in stress. This fear is just simply being afraid. This distress is the idea of this, this pressure of being between a straight, two pressures coming in, almost like the press uh, that the olive would be in and, and squeeze it until the oil comes out or the juice would come out of the, uh, perhaps the grape. It would be in the press. Fear and stress reveal simply our independence from God. So here is Jacob and he's afraid. And he's distressed. Let me ask, during this time, has fear come across you? <laughs> Are you afraid because of all of the things that go on with the virus? Are you afraid because of the political scene? 
Are you afraid because of the economic scene and the potential of what that may bring? Are you afraid of the unrest, just the spiritual climate of our country? Look, if we're coming away with fear, there, there's an absence there of faith of true dependence upon the Lord and recognizing that He is with me and that He is all-powerful. Fear is just a, an indicator to show us, you know what, I'm not trusting God like I ought to at that time. But also, He was not only greatly afraid, He was distressed. You know, this matter of stress can come out in so many different ways. It can come out in um, physical ailments and, and difficulties and and uh, all kinds of things. And uh, it, it, it's when we start to carry the pressures of our life, our um, family, our ministry, our whatever it is. Uh, and we're carrying them on our shoulders. When God said, no, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And he wants to help carry that burden. It was not meant for you to be carried, uh, carrying that burden. Um, Years ago, before we had this truck and trailer, we had a, another one. We were coming through El Paso, Texas. Something interesting always happens when we go through El Paso. We have to go through one more time. And I think El Paso means the passage, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if I'm correct on that. But it's like a passage to something unique. Maybe it's to a sermon illustration. And that's what it is tonight. And so we stopped at uh, in El Paso. And uh, as we did so, I noticed the trailer was going down in the back. And I don't have a low rider trailer. And uh, so I thought, what's going on? I looked underneath and several places and the, the, um, the suspension, the bolts and such, it was just ripped through the metal. And I thought, oh, no. It's a couple of tires are almost touching now because of the suspension not working correctly. And uh, just really of the Lord that we saw that. And, and so uh, I called different places. And the big truck places wouldn't take us at the time. And so um, I called another place and just a small place. And they said, yeah, we'll take you. So I, I take him to them. And, and he gets a little bitty hand jack out. And he starts to try to jack up our, our trailer. He goes, oh, man. You have one heavy trailer. I said, yes, I do. And uh, he said, let me, uh, let, let me go get something. I'll be right back. And I hear beep, beep, beep. I thought, what's that? And I look up, and there's a forklift coming my way. And on the forklift is a railroad tie that goes uh, is going across it. And he's coming towards the back of my trailer. And I go, well, oh, 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 what are you doing? He said, oh, you see, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to put this at the, the, um, the back of your trailer. Because at the back of your trailer, for the length of your trailer, there are steel beams that go from the back all the way to the front. And the frame is built on these two steel beams, which is true. And I'm going to, he said, I'm going to put the railroad tie and the forklift under the beams in the back. And I'm gonna, going to, quote, Pick that baby up, end quote. <laughs> if anybody comes to you and towards your RV with a, <laughs> with a forklift and a railroad tight, run. Do not let them do it. And I said, well, I don't know if that's a good idea. He said, oh, it's not going to be a problem. And so I said, well, let's just do the back axle. Just do one axle at a time. Well, he starts lifting it up slowly. And I could see it starting to rise up, you know. All the tires are still on the ground. But you can see it you're with the suspension. It starts to lift up the weight off that. And he keeps going. And now the back tires are off the ground. I thought, well, he'll stop. He didn't stop. He keeps going. Now the middle axle, the middle tires are off the ground. I thought he'd stop. He didn't stop. He keeps going. Now the front axle and the front tires are off the ground. Here it is. On that particular time, a 41-foot trailer, he picks it up here. And all the way towards the front, 41 feet later, it was connected to our truck. And it was off the ground the entire time. Well, wherever there's a slide out that goes out, there, is, it, there was fiberglass on that. There was a shorter amount of um, uh, shorter distance of fiberglass and during those those sections and I could see right in front of my eyes stress cracks start to form in the fiberglass and I said put it down put it down he said what, 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 what's wrong I said look there's cracks right here he goes he said those were there before I said, stay in the spirit, stay in the spirit. <laughs> and uh, so I said, no, sir, they were not. And, and uh, well, it ended, ended up where uh, he 
kind of patched the job. It was a halfway job. It did not fix it. And, and uh, we had those stress cracks for a number of years until we sold the trailer. Now, what was going on? Did the trailer become heavier? No, it was the same weight that we had the whole time. But he picked it up at a place that did not and was not intended to carry the weight. You see, whenever we take the pressures of this world and we put them on our shoulders, we're going, man, this is so hard. I can't make ends meet. And, and how do you do all this with the relationships in our family and got this problem and now that problem at work and now we got this and we have this going on here and, and I'm pulled over here and oh I'm just so stressed out and, and uh, you're feeling the pressure. Look, it does not matter how much pressure there is in your life, it matters where the pressure lies. And that one of the, uh, that quote right there was from a, 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 an author of the past. And, and what, what he's saying is this, is if Christ is carrying our burdens, then he's going to take the weight and we're not going to have to experience the stress that we do. But oftentimes we don't think we have stress. <laughs> One particular time I was in a revival meeting and I got a headache in the back of my head. It was really bad, and I try not to take, you know, anything at first. I'm just, I'm going to tough it out. Well, the second day, the headache didn't go away. I said, I got to take something. I took a Tylenol or Advil, didn't touch it. I'm like, I took something else, didn't touch it. I'm asking for, do you have any pain reliever, anything stronger, you know, whatever. And it just barely touched it, but it always was there. When I was sleeping, when I was eating, I would, uh, it was just always there. Third day. Fourth day, fifth day, people like, you need more caffeine. People said, get off caffeine. You know, uh, you need to do this. You need to do everybody, you know, had an answer. And uh, none of it helped. And, and uh, seven days or a whole week with this thing. And I thought, you know, I've got neck problems and back problems and such. So I'm going to a chiropractor this next week. And, and, um, and I'll bet you he'll help me. So I, I had this scheduled to go to this chiropractor. And I thought, you know, I'll go in, snap, crackle, pop. And, uh, you know, I'll be on my way and I'll be ready to go. And uh, so I walk in and he said, oh, I see you have uh, down here headaches. And uh, he said, tell me about this. Yeah, they're in the back of my head and, and, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. He goes, oh, okay, well, that's stress. I said, no, 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 it's not stress. It's not right here. It's back here. I mean, he's the doctor. He, he needs to be informed. And uh, so and it was back here and, uh, so, and, uh, and, uh, and all this. And I said, it's not stress. He goes, it's stress. And uh, he said, tell me about your schedule. I told him about my schedule, you know, going from one week to the next. And this last week, I, you know, we had, I preached three times a day. <laughs> when we, in the afternoon when I wasn't preaching, we were making visits or I was underneath the trailer fixing another trailer repair. And, and uh, he goes, yeah, it's stress. I said, it's not stress. <laughs> I said, it's, it's not stress. <laughs> and then he said, you know, the wrong result to stress, or that is stress this stressed out life is sin. And I go, wait a minute, who's the preacher and who's the doctor here? <laughs> I just happened to go to an independent Baptist uh, doctor, a chiropractor that was a part of R.B. Willett's church in, in, um, in Michigan. And, and I said, uh, man, I'm never going to a Baptist chiropractor again, <laughs> you know. In the next few minutes, you know what he started to do? He started to explain. He said, you know what you need to know is about the spirit-filled life. Because if you're spirit-filled, like you ought to be, you wouldn't have the stress that you're experiencing. In the next few minutes, he just talked about how to be spirit-filled and really experience the fullness of the spirit. And I knew everything that he said. But the Holy Spirit said to me, Chris Miller, you be quiet and you listen. Because you know it right here. But you're not depending upon it. And it was exactly what I needed. I'm not saying that every time you have a headache, <laughs> you're not right with God. <laughs> or every time you have uh, whatever, physically. But can you just be honest do you really have the peace that comes with the presence of God and his spirit filling you? Or is there an absence of that and it comes out in fear 
and this level of stress. And of course, then all of these other things as well. Would you recognize here is a place called Mahanaim, two hosts. Jacob, look up and see the angels. And your host right here, God will protect you. He'll be with you. But what does he do? Look, if you would, at verse 7, it says, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him when the flocks and herds and camels into how many bands? Two bands. Huh. A double host. Instead of taking God's plan, he went with his own plan. He said, okay, I'll put one wife and, and family and servants in this one, uh, and then I'll t- put another uh, wife uh, over here. So I'll put my favorite wife here and not-so-favorite wife here, favorite, not-so-favorite wife, you go first. And uh, I don't know, maybe that was the plan, I don't know. And, uh, but he put them into two bands just in case they got attacked and one could escape and one would probably perish. It was just what Jacob always has done. He's always tried to plan and manipulate and strategize and do all these things. The truth is, finally, he comes to the place where he comes to prayer. And in verses 9, 10, and 11, 12, he prays to God. Look, if you would, at verse 10 in his prayer. Here's Jacob's, finally, his dependency. He says in verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies, and all of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I have passed over this Jordan, now I am become two bands. <laughs> Verse 11, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. Would you realize this? This prayer is pretty important. Because in all of the recorded chapters of Scripture of Jacob's life, you could go back after chapter, after chapter, after chapter. Jacob was even mentioned in chapter 27. Chapters. And this is the very First time, Jacob was praying to God, and it was recorded in Scripture, and asking for God's help. First time. He's always been independent. Let me ask you, do you need to play, come to this place of dependency? Well, let me ask, how many times today did you ask God for his help? Is it that, oh, I can do that. I can go to work. I can go to school. I can do this. I can do that. Or is it, I need God's help with just even these daily things. I need God's help in my relationship. I need God's help with my relationship to my parents. I need God's help in this decision. Lord, I need you. Would you see that we need to come to the place of dependency and break down our flesh? What God wants to do is help us to recognize this week that flesh dependency will profit nothing. We need to recognize that we need to trust the Lord, just like we trusted him for our salvation. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, now, let me ask, can you earn your salvation? <laughs> that is, can you earn being saved from your sins? No. To be saved means you need to be rescued. You're helpless. It's just like someone that's that's drowning, they need a, a lifeguard to jump in and save them. Just like that, you call out to the Lord in your salvation and say, Lord, help, save me. And you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're here tonight and you've never done that, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need to come to the end of yourself because you're not good enough, I'm not good enough, Pastor Kramer's not good enough, none of us are to get on our, our way to heaven or save us from our own sin. We can't do it. We need to be rescued by someone else. And the only Savior that can rescue us is Jesus Christ. Would you trust him? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Look, you need to trust Jesus Christ fully and completely for your salvation. As a Christian, you need to come to a place where you trust Christ fully and completely to live the Christian life and to help you every single day. Let me ask, is this Mahanaim, this first place? The place of dependency, what you need to come to? Let's look at the second geographical location that it comes to. That's called Jabbok. What is Jabbok all about? What does it mean? Well, Jabbok means a place of passing over. It's going to be a transition, transitional place. We'll make the spiritual application in just a second. Look, if you would, at verse 20. 
Genesis chapter 32, verse 20, the Bible says, And say ye moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept of me. Interesting, uh, the word appease in this verse means to cover the face. And he says, maybe after this he will, I will see his face, and he'll be accepted, or I'll be accepted of him. Verse, if you will, look at verse um, 22. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. So here he is passing over Jabbok. Uh, now, what is this Jabbok? We said the meaning is a passing over. The Jabbok was a tributary of the Jordan River. And um, it says that he passed over the ford Jabbok. What is a ford? Is it an old, rusty, broken-down chariot? No, uh, it wasn't that. Uh, ford is a shallow crossing in the, the river. So uh, perhaps you could cross over. Maybe it would just be shin deep or whatever uh, the case would be. Uh, maybe uh, at that point you could pick up the young ones and you could cross over. The, the cattle and the, the animals could cross over without being washed downstream because it's not the deep part of the river. It's a transitional place. We're going to see the spiritual application is this, is Jabbok is the place of accuracy. And we're going to explain that in just a second. So he sends everyone else over. Look at verse 23. And he took them and sent them over in the brook and sent over that he had. And verse 24, help me out in verse 24 with a, a two words. It says, and Jacob was l what? Left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. You know, God wants to again get alone with us, doesn't he? We heard that last night. Would you recognize that God wants you to have an intimate, personal uh, walk with him? He wants to get alone with you. He loves you. And he wants uh, to be with you, uh, yourself. And so here he is. He's, he's left alone. And then all of a sudden... There's a shadow of a man. Okay, now think about this. Before the shadow of a man uh, appears, he doesn't know who it is. Maybe he's there at the Jabbok, and he's kind of pacing. And he's wondering, okay, you know, what am I going to say tomorrow when I see Esau? Um, I'll probably bow seven times, and I'll say this, and, and I'll say, please forgive me. I don't know what he's thinking, but he's obviously thinking about meeting his brother Esau. And then all of a sudden, there's a man in the shadows, and he just pops out, and he's... Uh, He's aggressive. He starts to attack, go towards him. Well, Jacob defends himself, and they start a wrestling match that lasts for hours. Now, who do you think Jacob thinks this dark figure, this shadowy figure is? Esau, his brother. Why not? And he's wrestling with him, and man, he can't win. He goes, wow, wow he's, really, he's really gotten better with his wrestling, and, and he just keeps wrestling with him. And, and in fact, look at verse 25. It says, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. Well, who touched whose hollow of his thigh? It says, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So the angel of the Lord touched Jacob's thigh and was out of joint. I don't know if it's that sciatic nerve, as some would say. Whoa. If you have ever pinched that sciatic nerve, you'll know. <laughs> One time I did that, and uh, for days I was down, but I tried to get up out of bed, and immediately it just collapsed. I could not. Um, it was just intensely painful. And it just really made it where you couldn't use the leg very much at all. And so they're wrestling now, and, and now Jacob, with his wrestling, he doesn't have his legs to balance him. He doesn't have his core to really kind of center all of his wrestling. Now he's just grabbing on to him. No doubt holding on. And the angel of the Lord is saying, let me go. Look at verse 26. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. So they're wrestling back and forth. His leg is now out of joint. He's got this limp that's going to be there all the time. And, and now he's grabbing him. And he says, let me go. He says, no, I'm not going to let you go. And he's just persistent and holding on to him. Here's Jacob. You know, that's, you can just see his personality coming out even in his fighting. And then all of a sudden, when he, after he says, let me go, no, except you bless me. And then here's what the angel Lord says. What is your name? Okay, here's Jacob. He's wrestling with it all night long. And then all of a sudden, he says, what is your name? 
You don't know who I am? I don't know if at what point, probably when he touched the hollow of his thigh, he probably realized this isn't Esau. But why would he wrestle with me and not know who I am? What is my name? You know what he said? Jacob. My, my name's Jacob. Supplanter. Deceiver. Manipulator. <laughs> Heel grabber. My name is Jacob. You know why he asked his name? Not for the angel's benefit. But so Jacob could see himself as he truly was. And some of us here are acting like Jacob. <laughs> There's sin in our hearts and our lives that we need to confess. And this Jake, this Jabbok is the place of accuracy where Jacob is finally seeing himself for who he truly is. He was a thief. He was a cheat. He was a liar. He distressed and feared and he manipulated and strategized. He focused on finances. He was rash in his decisions. Let me ask, do you have the sin of cheating? What about a young person? Have you been honest in your schoolwork? I remember when I was in fifth grade, we were supposed to write the entire, the entire Declaration of Independence. And I cheated. And I thought, you know, the angel, the, uh, the angel Lord's going to smite me right now. You know, I cheated. And um, I'm writing it, you know, when I had to just plan just right. Acting like I'm writing it, you know, and all these things. I cheated. And then the teacher said, Chris? Yes? I need you to come up here. Yes, ma'am? I need you to take the erasers and go pound them outside. Yes, ma'am, I sure will, and I'll be the best eraser pounder you've ever seen. Man, I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. I got away with that. Or did I? Then uh, we got the test back, and I got a phenomenally excellent score. Very good, Chris. But every time I thought about it, I had a guilty feeling. I went to uh, sixth grade, next classroom over. They still didn't find out. I went over, now, I was in the same school as a Christian school, and then went to the junior high. And it was over the steps and on the other side as the big kids. <laughs> I was in seventh grade, and the teacher said, hey, can you take these papers over to the elementary side? I said, sure. Oh, there's little, little kids. Walk over the steps, you come down the steps, and right, the first door you see is a fifth grade door. So that's the class that I cheated on the Declaration of Independence. It was two years ago. And then ninth grade. You know, I had to get right with the principal and the teacher years afterwards because it just kept eating and eating and eating at me that I hadn't confessed that sin of cheating. Maybe there's some in here tonight who say, you know, I've been a Jacob in that way. How about the sin of stealing? You've taken something that's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. No matter what the size, the principle is still the same and it's still sin. How about the sin of deceiving? Well, it's not like I really lied, but you're hiding that from your spouse. And you're not telling the truth to your parents. It's a sin of deceiving. If you're stressed out because of work and pressures and, man, it comes out with now you're short with your wife and you're upset with your husband, comes out with anger, you're trusting your own wisdom 
leaning to your own understanding. Maybe you're trying to manipulate things to work out the way you want them to work out. Is there an over-focus on finances? Look, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Are you rash and impetuous in your decisions? Maybe, just maybe tonight, we've got a room full of Jacobs. If we're going to be honest, we've been trusting ourselves. And we don't see our sin as it really is a sin against God. Would you allow God to take you to the second place, the Jabbok, which is the place of accuracy, to see your sin and confess it and being right with him? First, Jacob was brought to Mahanaim, the place of dependency. Secondly, Jabbok, the place of accuracy. Then finally, we see him being brought to Peniel. What is Peniel? Peniel is the place of intimacy. It's the place of intimacy. Look, if you would, at verse 28 through verse 30, the Bible says, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And we'll, we'll get back to that in a second. Look at verse 30. It says, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I've seen God face to face. My life is preserved. He gets a name change. His name is no longer Jacob, it's Israel. He says, now you have, according to verse 28, power with God and with men. With God is in prayer, with men is favor. It's favor from God. Do you have those things? Let me ask, do you have the power with God? That you can go to God boldly and in a matter of prayer. And we're going to see very clearly that it wasn't Jacob twisting God's arm and making God do something he doesn't want to do. And he was just so persistent that he had this mighty power. No, it was not the case. But now he had an intimacy. We saw God face to face. You know, Moses in our passage yesterday, we didn't get to go through all of that in chapter 33. But he wanted to see the Lord and, and he wanted to meet with him. And it says at one particular time that Moses met with the Lord face to face, and Joshua was just in the tabernacle. He wasn't quite there, but he met with the Lord face to face. But then later he says, show me uh, and let me know you and know your glory. He says, you can't see my face. You can't, no one can see my face and live. How can he just was face to face? Well, I think it was a, a, it was a, a face to face spiritually rather than the full physical glory being revealed. Otherwise, he would have died. He couldn't, and that's why God passed before him and showed him just his back rather than his face because he is so glorious. But the whole idea is this, is that he got alone with him face to face, and God wants that intimacy with you. God wants you to come to close to him, so close that you're intimate with him. One of the Psalms, I believe it's Psalm 7, it says this, Psalm 7 and verse 2, keep me I keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. Sometimes in the Psalms it talks about uh, the apple of my eye. The Lord keeps us as the apple of my eye. <laughs> or Lord keep me as the apple. What's that mean, the apple of your eye? Well, well the center of your eye, the pupil, uh, the Latin word that we get from pupil, it comes, pupilla, it comes and it means little man or little, little doll. And it literally, it also means apple. There's some, somehow the, the definition is in there. And, and, uh, and so that pupil is, originally it means apple, but then the, the definition comes from this little man, little dog. You say, what, what do you mean little man, little apple? That doesn't make sense. Well, when you go up to someone and you look in their eye and you're really close, try it tonight. <laughs> what do you see? When you get really close to someone's eye, you see a reflection of yourself. Now, I can see everybody here tonight. I can see whether you're awake or asleep, and all of you are awake, and I'm very proud of you. <laughs> but I can't see a reflection of myself. I'm not that close. But when I come face to face with my wife, one of my family members, and we're that close, 
then I can see a reflection of me. Let me ask, can you describe your relationship with God as intimate, close? Would God describe your relationship with him as intimate? You know what? When he looks, when you look into God's eyes, he can see a reflection of you because you're so close to him. Would you say, dear God, draw me nearer and draw me close to you. I need you so desperately. What place do you need to come to tonight? The place of dependency, the place of accuracy, the place of intimacy. Would you trust the Lord in whatever place that God would have for you? Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help. Lord, I pray that you'd help each one here that that has not trusted Jesus Christ to make the decision to, to be saved and to trust you. Lord, I pray for ones that are saved to, to make decisions of dependency and accuracy and confessing their sin and, and also intimacy of drawing closer to you. Lord, work in our hearts, I pray. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, let me ask, if you're here and you say, Preacher, there's one thing I know for sure. If I died right now, I'd go to heaven because... I've trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, can you raise your hand tonight? I've already done so. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. That's great. Fantastic. Good. Wonderful. I couldn't see anybody that didn't raise their hand, but maybe I missed somebody. If you're here and you say, Preacher, would you pray for me? I don't know if I died if I go to heaven. I don't know if I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. If you don't know about that, and you say, would you pray for me? Right where you're seated. If you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, would you let me pray for you? Anyone like that, would you say, I don't know if I die if I go to heaven. Would you raise your hand? Anyone like that real quickly? I don't know for sure. Would you pray for me, preacher, about that? Okay, let me ask then. All those that are saved here, that are Christians, what place do you believe that God wants you to come to tonight? Have you been fearful and stressing out? Have you been just taking things into your own hands, leaning to your own wisdom? Do you need to come to the place of dependency? Maybe for you, it's accurately to confessing your sin and asking the Lord to help you see your sin. You need to come to the place of accuracy. Maybe for you, you say, I'm not close to the Lord like I used to be or like I should be. I couldn't say that my relationship with God would be intimate. You need to come to the place of intimacy. If God spoke to you in one of these areas, or maybe a combination, or all three. You say, God's spoken to me in one of these, or all three. God's spoken to me, and I need to make a decision about that tonight. Would you just respond by upraised hand? Say, that's me. God bless you. Good. Praise the Lord. A number of hands. That really is wonderful. Thank you. God bless you. Anyone else? You say, God's spoken to me. Maybe I've been, I haven't been what I should be. I've been lying. I've been cheating. I've, I've been deceiving. I've, I've been just trusting myself. I haven't been right with God. God, God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Good. Anyone else? God's spoken to you about some of these things. I need to make these decisions and depend upon the Lord in these areas. Okay? Everyone look right here. In just a moment, we're going to stand. And after I stand, I'll pray, and we'll have, then we'll have the pianist play. Like we did last night, When after I pray, would you just find a place um, to, to pray. Maybe it's up here at the front, or maybe it's a, one of the side chairs there, or maybe it's just at your own chair. And if you're physically capable to kneel, I would just kneel and spend some time with the Lord. And when you're finished, you can stand back up, and we'll know that you're done praying uh, to the Lord about that decision. Several raise their hand. Let's be responsive to the Lord and say, Dear God, help me and revive my heart to draw me closer to you. Everyone standing. Father, I ask for your help right now with each one that raised their hand. Help them to respond to you, Lord, I pray, accordingly and honestly. And Lord, I ask that you draw us all closer to you in what we need to make our decision tonight. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, God's spoken to you. Would you raise your, if you raised your hand, would you step out and come? Or would you pray about that as she plays? God bless you. Good. God bless you. That's great. Did you make the decision to raise your hand? Just take a moment, maybe kneel or pray, and to just ask the Lord to help you with that. That's good. Very good. God bless you. Men and ladies and young people.
others are praying, did God speak to your heart? Why don't you take some time as well? Perhaps you're even watching. Would you just take some time and ask the Lord to help you with that decision? You could look right here. Thank you so much, Evangelist Miller, for that message. And uh, I'm, I, I know my heart was touched and challenged, and I pray your was as well. If, if there's an, uh, a need that you have that you would like to you know, um, just get a little more help with, we'd be happy to do that. Um, just uh, Evangelist Miller's in the back right now, and, and you can just mention to him, hey, I, I just have a few more questions, or myself as well. We'd be happy to help you. And I think it's very interesting that before Jacob could have that intimacy with the Lord, he had to come to a place of dependency and accuracy first. And um, so very, very practical and powerful message tonight, and I pray that you'll take it and, um, you know, that we would desire to be with God face to face, and uh, what, a, what a great challenge for us tonight. A reminder as you leave tonight, if you're able to give something in the offering for Evangelist Miller, I know it'd be a blessing to their family. Service tonight, tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m., uh, prayer time tomorrow night at 6 p.m. We'll be in the kitchen. If you're able to stay just for a few minutes after the service, uh, it, it's just a very brief prayer time. And um, uh, I, I think your heart will be encouraged if you're able to stay. And uh, for the men and teen guys, if you'd like to go on the hike tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., meet right here. We look forward to it. Lord bless you. Have a great night. Mm -hmm.